Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. I am delighted to see you all here, and of course we have others online by the miracles of uh, modern technology around the world. Um, you're all very welcome, and I'm very glad you've made it out in what is really a rather cold and inclement period uh, here weather-wise in Scotland. Before we proceed to the main business, I'd like to ask our director um, to read the minutes and to tell us any announcements. Simon. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, the minutes of the anniversary meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland held at 12 noon in the Augustine United Church, Edinburgh, and on Zoom on St. Andrew's Day, Wednesday, 30th November, 2022. Ian Ralston, President of the Society, in the chair. The minutes of the previous lecture meeting were read and approved. The Treasurer's annual report was proposed and accepted by fellows. The Director's annual report was proposed and accepted by fellows. The results of the ballots were announced, with all 65 candidates elected to fellowship, and the Treasurer, Dr Kenneth Aitchison, re-elected. Professor Ian Baxter and Emma Carver were duly elected as councillors and therefore trustees of the Society. RBK Stevenson Award, the RBK Stevenson Award was presented to Dr. Julie Holder for her paper, Joseph Anderson, 1832 to 1916, and the Scottish Historical Collection in the Antiqui Antiquities Museum, 1869 to 1892. The Dorothy Marshall Medal was awarded to Mr. Martin Wildgoose and accepted on his behalf by Professor Karen Hardy. The President's address was presented. After the formal proceedings, Naila Shoma Mason presented a short paper entitled Forgotten Stories, and the anniversary meeting closed with a reception. Thank you, Simon. May I sign these as a correct record? Yes, I see nods. I'll do that in due course. So, um, a couple of notices. I just want to say thank you to all those who attended both in person and online to the anniversary meeting, and especially all those who brought books and merchandise. Um, and I'd just like to let you know that we made over £500 just at the anniversary meeting. So thank you very much for your generosity. Uh, I also want to make a note that the offices of the Society will be closed over Christmas in Hogmanay from the 23rd of December and reopening on the 9th of January. Uh, and finally, just best wishes for the festive season from both myself and all the rest of the staff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, tonight, it's my very great uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker, who I think is amongst the archaeologists I've known for the longest time uh, since we met on the top of a hill in East Lothian in 1965 or thereby whilst excavating for uh, one of his Cambridge lecturers. Uh, let me introduce Emeritus Professor James Graham Campbell uh, from uh, University College London, where he was uh, became Emeritus Professor uh, in 2002, and then went on to be a special professor at the University of Nottingham and an honorary professor at Aarhus in Denmark. James will, I'm sure, be known to many of you. He was our Rhine lecturer in 1996 and uh, throughout his career has uh, studied, amongst other things, uh, Scottish Viking silver, on which he has uh, written uh, the most important monograph by far. He's now working on the Viking graves of Scotland with colleagues. And tonight, he's going to speak to us about Caloran Bay, the Viking boat burial there. And I'd now like him to invite him to address us. James, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for this warm welcome on this uh, cold evening. I want to take you back now to uh, June uh, 1882, when the remains of a Viking boat burial were discovered quite accidentally in the sand dunes of Killoran Bay, here on the west coast of Colonsay, discovered as the result, I quote, of curiosity being awakened by one or two clinker nails cast up at the mouth of a rabbit burrow. The finder was one Malcolm McNeil, whose elder brother had been the lad of Colonsay for the previous five years. 
The story of McNeil's discovery and its subsequent history, that is to say the biography of this remarkable find, is a complex one, but it needs to be fully explored if we are to attempt a reconstruction of the pagan Norse funeral that took place on this Hebridean island over a thousand years ago. For this, we shall have to spend some time in another lost world, that of Victorian antiquaries and archaeologists, but also of their immediate successors, who in this case were mostly Norwegians. If we want to recover as much as possible about what is undoubtedly the richest and certainly the most elaborate male Viking burial yet to have been found in Scotland. No doubt many of you are familiar with the beauty of Colonsay, uh, this uh, small island, and I think I've got some sort of electronic pointer which enables me to point out exactly where Colonsay uh, is. This small island, which is only eight miles long, located between Mull to the north, Isla to the south, and with Jura to the east, but open to the western seaways. Uh, at its southern end, is it, it is separated by a tidal strand from its immediate neighbour, the smaller, even smaller island of Orense, which is also well known uh, in itself for its Mesolithic middens, the ruins of a medieval priory, and another important Viking burial place. The landscape of Colonse is varied, with Caloran Bay towards its northern end being just one of several fine beaches. Indeed, the next bay to the south, at Macrins, another Viking boat burial has also been found, although it was more poorly excavated in 1891, but a comparable find, almost certainly. Colonse has a fertile uh, interior, sufficiently sheltered to be unusually well wooded for a Hebridean island. In all respects, therefore, it would have been a most inviting prospect for Norse Vikings on the lookout for settlement opportunities in the 9th century. Indeed, there was a remarkable concentration of pagan Norse burials known from Colonse and Orense. But my concern today is with just the one Viking boat burial that are from uh, Killoran Bay. This was excavated on two occasions in the 1880s. First, as already mentioned, by Malcolm McNeil in 1882, and then a couple of years later by William Galloway, of whom more uh, later, because he was responsible not only for delivering two papers on the subject to the Society of Antiquaries in London, which he then failed to publish, but also for having organized the first public displays of these finds, first in London and then here in Edinburgh, as well as a private view of some of the best for Queen Victoria at Balmoral. But first, the location. Galloway described the location of the boat burial in a newspaper article which he wrote to publicize the display of the finds in Edinburgh in 1885. He wrote, the scene of interment lies amid the wild, uncultivated sand dunes at the head of Killoran Bay, between two and three hundred yards from the existing beach. No indication remained of what lay beneath, curiosity being awakened by one or two clinker nails cast up at the mouth of a rabbit burrow. Rough ground, sand blown and blowing, sparsely covered with bent grass and thistles, alone met the eye. A somewhat more romantic than precise description of the fine place, you will have to agree. But fortunately, more precise information was preserved by the McNeil family, and the site was marked on a map by Symington Grieve in his 1923 book of Colonse and Orense, marked towards the southern end of the bay, uh, close to a freshwater burn. I'll see if I can make this magic thing work again. There's the burn coming out there, and we're looking at this area here. Uh, and this corresponds um, with uh, the, an area marked on the first edition, the 1880 edition of the uh, six-inch Ordnance Survey map, uh, as being an area with uh, a, a sand pit. Marked here, uh, there's an area uh, marked just a few years before on the Ordnance Survey map as being a sand pit. So presumably an area where there was already erosion taking place, somewhere where the rabbits could burrow, could burrow in, so just where a chance find might uh, be expected. Now for the excavations. No first-hand account of McNeil's excavation is known to exist, 
but the measurements taken by him in 1882 form the basis for a fine plan, seen here, for a fine plan and section which was discovered by Graham Ritchie during preparatory research for the Royal Commission's inventory of Argyle. The plan was drawn up by William Galloway for display at the International Fisheries Exhibition in London in 1883, uh, together with a selection of the grave goods. And then it was in the following year, in August 1884, that Galloway himself undertook the further examination, which he described in a paper read to the Society of Antiquities in London in 1885. Now, William Galloway, who lived from 1832 to 1897, was a Scottish architect with strong archaeological interests, best known for his restoration work uh, on Whitorm Priory. What is known of his life and career as both architect and antiquary has been researched by Dr. Anna Ritchie, to whom I am most grateful for her advice and assistance. However, no image of him has been found, so here's a challenge for all of you. Please go forth and find us his likeness. Galloway spent some time in Colonsay and Orensay in the 1870s, and then for more extended periods between 1881 and 1887. He appears to have stayed often with the McNeil family in Colonsay House, and by June 1882, he was the acknowledged antiquary on the island, for he wrote to Sir Henry Dryden to tell him that, I quote, the family have, on their own initiative, conferred on me the sole privilege of archaeological investigation, both on Colonsay and Orensay and printed notices to this effect have been hung up in the inn and other places. As a practical result of this arrangement, funds have been placed in my hands to make a commencement in clearing out the ruins of Orensey Priory. In fact, Galloway had shortly before excavated three short kissed burials at Urigaig, not far from Colonsay House. However, it appears that he was away working on Orensey Priory when Malcolm McNeil made his discovery of the boat burial although it is probable, as Anna Ritchie has suggested, that he would at least have seen the excavation, even if he had had no part in it. In any case, it was to be Galloway, who in May 1883 communicated to the London antiquaries a, quote, a paper on various remains from a Viking's grave and from three kists of the Neolithic period recently opened in the island of Colonsay. It was stated at the time that this paper will be published in the Archaeologia, but he seems never to have submitted his text for publication. However, three watercolour drawings of grave goods from Killoran Bay are preserved in the London Society's archives. These are signed, here's one, here's, these are signed Rosa Wallace, Dell, 1883. Rosa was then a young artist. She was the daughter of George Wallace, who was senior keeper of the art collection at South Kensington Museum. Her drawings provide a most valuable record of the finds that Galloway took to London for display at the Fisheries Exhibition, which opened in South Kensington on the 12th of May, 1883. Alas, no manuscript is known to survive of Galloway's paper on the Viking grave, although there exists a fair copy of the second part uh, about the kissed burials in the archives of our society. This forms part of a small group of papers concerning Galloway's discoveries in Colonsay and Orensay, uh, that, were, uh, that were given uh, uh, by his sister uh, following his death in 1897. They were given by his sister to Joseph Anderson, while keeper of the National Museum, with the intention that Anderson would then put them on record. The printed catalogue of the International Fisheries Exhibition contains little details, a few details, concerning the various relics from Killoran Bay and his brief text was clearly abstracted from Galloway's more extensive manuscript, Catalogue Raisonné of the Loan Collection, uh, which uh, also exists as a fair copy among the Galloway papers presented to Anderson. Given that it was written in 1883, it contains the earliest extant account of the original investigation of the boat burial and has been published by Anna Ritchie. And I shall just quote the most relevant parts, illustrating them uh, with the uh, Wallace, uh, with the plan and Wallace uh, watercolours. It reads in part then, the grave in question of which a plan and section are shown, I've already introduced you to that, um, was discovered quite accidentally by, by Malcolm McNeil, etc. And from it, the following objects are exhibited. 
a series of clinker nails or rivets, such as in Scandinavia, are marked as the invariable accompaniments uh, of a ship burial. They are, a couple of, uh, of them are shown at the bottom of Wallace's uh, drawing here. They were found strewn indiscriminately and at all depths through the body of sand filling the grave. Two, another mount full of miscellaneous iron objects, including two knives corroded together. These have, in fact, turned out to be a pair of arrowheads, although there are, in fact, also knives from the grave. Three, an iron sword of the usual Norse pattern, subsequent to deposition in the grave, but while still uncorroded, it must have been subjected to a heavy superincumbent weight while being at the same time held fast to the two extremities. The result is the curvature shown and the upturned point. Here it must be noted that the supposed upturned point on the end of this sword is in fact an entirely separate uh, pot handle from an iron uh, a cooking vessel, which <laughs> somehow got mistaken to be an extension of... So the whole thing about this being bent in the grave is all uh, 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 a made-up interpretation. Fourthly, uh, an iron spearhead. You see that at the top of the watercolour. Five, the head of an iron battle axe. You see it on the right-hand side. And six, the umbo or centre boss of a shield, which has been covered with a strong textile fabric. As an aside, I might point out that the presence here of this complete set of five weapons, sword, axe, spear, shield and arrows, is only matched in one other grave uh, from Britain and Ireland, um, this, uh, ninth, this uh, uh, ninth century boat burial of a Norwegian Viking who settled at West Ness in Orkney, seen here during excavation in the 1970s. Now to return to Galloway's catalogue of exhibits and the drawings of Wallace, <coughs> the next category is bronze objects. Of these, by far the most important are the power of scales, the beams and weights, etc. All shown on this uh, uh, slide. They were found the scales, one within the other, lying between the knees and cranium of the skeleton, just in front of the body. The second case uh, contains portions of bronze belting and terminal plates which have been riveted onto leather straps. Also a bronze pin, that's on the um, side there, uh, and terminal plates, sorry, a, a very perfect buckle and four buttons, some of them with pieces uh, of uh, leather still adhering. With the exception of the, of the personal dress pin, these fittings all belong to a set of insular horse harness that's being researched by Caroline Patterson. In order to illustrate the find more completely, he says, a few of the larger bones and a portion of the cranium of the Viking have been included. Here ends the, my, my quotation. I should add that the human skeleton uh, is in poor condition, but the bones are fairly robust and indicative of a male, the state of whose teeth suggest an age of over 40 years. Uh, on a visit to the fisheries exhibition in London, the Reverend Joas of Golshby made, this, made a rough uh, sketch, copying the plan and section and sketching some of the finds, if not very accurately. But on returning to Scotland, he gave his drawings to his old friend, Joseph Anderson, at the National Museum, which becomes important later. Now back to Killoran Bay itself. Visits made to the eroding site following the 1882 excavation resulted in three small coins being picked up on the surface in the form of copper alloy stikers or Northumbrian pennies. They were all found within the area enclosed, but on the surface, as the sand dried and blew away, and chiefly by Mr. Duncan McNeil, the son to Malcolm McNeil Square, during occasional holiday visits to the island. These discoveries, of which only two survive, will doubtless have enhanced Galloway's desire to undertake further investigation of the site, which he then carried out in 1884. The following year, in June 1885, Galloway wrote to Dryden that the antiquaries London were in possession of his account of the Collins they find, and it will be read at their last meeting 
on the 25th next. According to the minutes of this meeting, it says again, the account will be published in the Archaeologia. However, nothing about Calorum Bay was ever published by Galloway in the Archaeologia or anywhere else. Although the London Antiquaries do possess four watercolour drawings by him that were presumably used to illustrate his second paper, for they are signed by him June 1885. They include this further plan uh, which shows the position of various objects found in the Viking grave and also the skeleton of a horse outside the enclosed area. He also provided a, a full-size depiction of the lower part of the right hind limb of the horse, showing wounds received while still in life, together with two drawings of cross-engraved schist slabs, also full-size, so they can't really be photographed. Uh, a fair copy of Galloway's paper is fortunately preserved amongst those given to Anderson after his death. As a primary source for the Caloran Bay boat burial, it deserves publishing in full, but for now some quotation will suffice. Uh, it opens, um, in the recollection of the members that on the 10th of May, 1883, I had the, the honor of reading a paper before the Society upon a Viking grave, first discovered in June, 1882. And then he repeats the, 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 the leading features. No need for me to repeat them now, so I'll pick up the narrative a bit further on. He writes, it having, it having always been my intention to make a further examination of the locality, I took the opportunity of doing so while on a visit to Collinsay House in August last. I found the place quite undisturbed since the previous explorations. A heap of schist stones strewn over where the workings had been alone met the eye. Lying towards the west end of this heap, I found the cross-graven slab to be afterwards noticed with, small, with spade and small pick, I searched the sand, but only found a few clinker nails and fragments of human bones until going outside the area previously examined and immediately to the east of where the line of enclosure on that side must have been, I came accidentally on part of the limb bone of a large mammal. Following up this clue, I gradually uncovered the entire skeleton of a horse lying on its right side. And here's the very horse. A horse about 15 hands high and from 15 to 20 years of age. Archaeologically, the most interesting part of the skeleton is the right hind limb, indicating as it does the probable manner in which the animal was slain, either in battle or otherwise. A terrific blow on the right hind limb must have disabled the animal and may most probably have been received in battle in which the rider also may have fallen. Well, I think again, his, his imagination is, is running, running away with him here. And I should share with you the current opinion that the horse was actually aged a more reasonable six to eight years with a height of about 14.2 hands and would have died from having had its throat cut or from being stabbed to death given that there are no traces of lethal wounds on the skeleton, although it had perhaps been immobilized by having its right hamstring cut. Horse killing is a well-known burial rite in Viking Age Scandinavia, but particularly in Iceland, uh, where re a recent estimate is that horses were deposited in at least 41% of the known burials, both male and female. Uh, not so in Scotland, however, where my uh, uh, total is 13, uh, both in, the, uh, in, in, in Orkney and Caithness and in the, uh, the Hebrides in the, uh, uh, in the southwest. Uh, 13, so not even 7% of the approximately 220 graves, of which uh, I think there is some record. Anyway, returning to Galloway's account of his excavation, he continues, one of the most noteworthy features of the discovery was the large number of clinker nails or rivets and other iron objects, both in and around the remains as found. They seem to have permeated the skeleton in every way. And with the undisturbed state of the remains found now and previously, suggests the idea that the ship may have been capsized over them the clinker nails falling down as their timbers gradually decayed. 
Had the Norseman, his horse, arms, and other grave goods been disposed within the ship, set upon an even keel, as in several recorded instances in Scandinavia, it seems impossible for them, on the decay of the wooden structure by which they, were, which, which they would in any case have been supported, to have subsided in the absolutely undisturbed manner in which they were found. Apart from these relics, he says, apart from these relics spared to us by time, we can only surmise the aspect this grave must have presented long centuries ago. A lofty how or mound there must have been enclosing a stout ship, and many things to us most interesting had their preservation been possible. But all the more patent and more perishable evidences of the ancient sea king's interment have long since disappeared, while the storms of a thousand winters have been singing their requiem over his lonely and unnoted grave. This rather romantic um, paragraph includes a remarkably perceptive observation on Galloway's part, for the apparently empty spaces within the burial enclosure would doubtless have been filled with organic equipment and supplies for both man and his horse. Galloway's report continues with a section devoted to the two cross-graven slabs seen here, which not surprisingly have given rise to considerable speculation on his part and, uh, and ever since. He wrote, as already mentioned, among the roughed shift slabs strewn over the surface of the ground and which had previously formed part of the enclosure, lying at the west end, I found one with a Latin cross of the simplest and most primitive form incised upon it. Like the others, this slab is quite undressed and rough as it came from the hillside. The second slab I found at the east end of the enclosure, I, there was one at both, at both ends, opposite ends. It had not been previously disturbed, but lay buried amongst the sand which had to be cleared away in order to uncover the skeleton of the horse. There can be no doubt of the high antiquity of these symbols, or that they are in all probability coeval with the interment. The only difficulty being to account for their presence under such peculiar circumstances. All the indications go to prove that the interment belongs to the Norse pagan period. The attitude of the body, which is crouched, was precisely that so familiar to us in the short-kissed pagan interments, and the orientation directly the reverse of that practiced under Christianity. The mere fact of the man being so interred with all his grave goods and belongings shows an unbroken belief in the pagan ideas of the afterworld and the place the Norsemen of that era expected to occupy in it. He continues, there have also been found in this grave three Anglo-Saxon stikers, and so within the latter half of the ninth century, or not very long thereafter, the burial may very reasonably be reckoned. While over a century had yet to relapse, ere Norse Christianization had even begun, at the same time it must not be forgotten that on the site now occupied by Collinsley House, there stood the earliest and most noted ecclesiastical establishment in the island, only a mile distant from and fully within sight of the scene of the interment. There cannot be a shadow of doubt as to the authenticity of the facts, nor do I think that there can be any as to their contemporaneous uh, character. And the, and the occurrence of these cross-graven slabs under circumstances so peculiar seems to me one of the most singular features of this interment. Galloway's account concludes with a description of the Anglo-Saxon Stiker coins. Um, these coins, which are as yet only three in number, were not found in the ordinary course of exploration, unless indeed the sand had been sifted, a troublesome process owing to its partial dampness. From their small size, they could scarcely have been found. They had been found entirely within the area enclosed, but on the surface as the sand dried and blew away and on being consigned to my care, I forwarded them to the British Museum. So Reginald Poole. And Reginald Poole declared one of them to be illegible, and it has unfortunately long been missing. But the two existing coins, both of which are pierced through the center, as you see on the slide, are today identified as one issued by Archbishop Wigmund, 837 to 854, while the other is from Ethelred II's first reign, 
and that's from 841 to 844. Uh, I shall turn now to the biography of the fines from the 1880s to the 1990s. And as explained by Anna Ritchie, I quote, It is around this time, in the early 1880s, that William Galloway appears to have fallen out with Joseph Anderson at the National Museum, perhaps over the artifacts from the Orange shell, mine, shell mines and or those from the Caloran Bay ship burial. After the flurry of his contributions in the 1870s, Galloway took no more part in our society meetings or publications after 1880. Instead of giving the Antiquaries Museum the finds from his excavations, either he retained them in his own collection, or as in the case of the Viking artifacts from Colonsay, he loaned them to the Museum of Science and Art, which of course later became the Royal Scottish Museum. This falling out remains something of a mystery, but as Davy Clark has observed, the group of Scottish antiquaries at the end of the 19th century was not a harmonious group. Describing Anderson as a man of firm views who was, who was respected rather than loved. Indeed, it is evident from letters written by Galloway to Sir Henry Dryden only a few years earlier that there can have been no love lost uh, on Galloway's part for the man he once described as the hard-headed Joseph commenting to Dryden on another that Jose would tell us that we were both fools to waste a previous summer on such a well-trodden spot as Iona. Medievalism is a very secondary or non-interest at all with J.A. I don't find this to Joseph Anderson. He was a considerable, uh, uh, had a considerable interest in the Viking period, at least, if, even if there was a cut-off point uh, there. Anyway, returning to Caloran Bay and its loan to the Museum of Science and Art in 1885, we find that the list of objects uh, includes this uh, box in Scotch walnut, which I show this evening courtesy of the National Museum and Adrian Maldonado. In a newspaper article written by Galloway to publish his loan, which I've already mentioned, he acknowledges that it was made with the kind permission of Sir John McNeil VC KCB KCMG, and specifically mentions this walnut box, stating, I quote, that all the bronze objects have been arranged in an elegant case and are exhibited as shown to Her Majesty at Balmoral in November last, when Sir John was presumably in attendance uh, at court. It is a fine example of a Victorian display case, uh, as you can see, and contains within uh, two layers. Here the uppermost is provided with spaces for the scales uh, and the weights. And on the top, there is an incised plaque which identifies it as the property of Sir John C. McNeill of Colonsay, 1884. Uh, however, in March 1885, Galloway wrote somewhat possessively that my Viking horse and things are now on view in the museum in Chambers Street, where they were displayed in two large cases that had been made especially for them. But shortly after, in December the following year, he sent a letter to A.W. Franks at the British Museum, offering the fines on loan to the BM but Franks wrote back declining uh, for want of space, or perhaps, as Anna Ritchie has speculated, because he was unwilling to become involved in robbing another museum of part of its displays. After this failure to have the fines removed to the BM, they remained at the Royal Scottish uh, until 1924, when they were transferred on loan to the National Museum, except for the horse but together with three additional artifacts that had also been found in Colonsay. They thus arrived at the museum in Queen Street in time for them to be studied there the following year by the visiting Norwegian archeologist Sigurd Grieg, when he was unfortunately led to believe that all these objects were directly associated, thereby creating considerable confusion, which it has only recently been possible to unscramble. Grieg's inventory that he made on following that visit was first published in summary form by his fellow Norwegian, Professor Anton Brueger, in 1930, accompanied by the earliest photograph uh, of any of the finds, one of which, this one that you see here, uh, uh, includes very faintly uh, at the bottom, a uh, hitherto unrecorded Brunner fragment, which Grieg catalogued as fragment of a small whetstone of a grey rock pointed at one extremity, rounded at the other, somewhat worn. 
You may recall that Galloway has made no mention of any whetstone from the burial, and there is no evidence with which to support this attribution. Indeed, it has since been identified as a metallistic stone tool, and has in fact apparently gone missing. Breger's photograph of pins and harness mounts, which you see here, shows at the top a bronze ringed pin, now also known not to be from the burial, uh, together uh, with this small bronze conical mount that you see at the bottom uh, of this uh, image, where it is shown alongside six of the Kiloran Bay weights. This pin and mount should never have been associated with the boat burial, for they belong to another Colonsay Viking grave altogether, fortunately documented in this illustrated letter from Galloway to Dryden, written in 1885, in which he describes their discovery and sketches both the pin and the conical object. Uh, and he, he describes their location uh, at a place identified by Anna Ritchie as being in the area of Macrins, and so south of Killoran Bay, not from Killoran Bay at all. In 1979, the loan to the National Museum was converted into a donation, and during the 80s and 90s, more detailed research was undertaken in preparation for the opening of the New Museum of Scotland in 1998, when the grave goods were finally reunited with the horse skeleton and placed on display together in the Early People's Gallery. So what of um, publications? Well, in October 1906, the distinguished Norwegian archaeologist Håkon Schettlig visited Edinburgh in the aftermath of Professor Gustafsson's 1904 excavation of the famous Oseberg ship burial, which you see here in Pregus with Gustafsson at the centre. Um, Schettlig is in fact not in this photograph, although he was uh, acting as Gustafsson's assistant. During his visit to Edinburgh, Shetlig saw the finds from Killoran Bay on display in the Museum of Science and Art and immediately wrote a brief account of the burial for publication in the saga book, so as to, so as to appear as an addendum to the paper that he had given on Viking ship burials uh, to the Viking Society during his visit to London the previous winter. He immediately had, had, had recognised the importance uh, of this find, even though, of course, the Oseberg ship burial is so much uh, more uh, significant. Seven months later, Joseph Anderson read to the Society what he called an abstract concerning the Viking grave mound at Killoran Bay, which he derived from Galloway's unpublished notes. Now, given that Anderson had been sitting on Galloway's papers since 1899, it seems highly probable that this sudden burst of activity on his part was occasioned by the imminence of Shetlig's own publication. However, what is strange but true is that Anderson based his own account not on personal examination of the finds, which were, after all, just up the road, but he used those sketches done by Joas at the Fisheries Exhibition in London. For example, Anderson would not otherwise have described so wrongly the balance beam as having an ornamental trefoil on top, a detail that Joas invented, nor the pin as having a small globular head, uh, again, uh, an invention uh, of, of um, Joas, because you can see on, on, on Wallace's uh, uh, drawing uh, that, 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 that the pin uh, uh, has got uh, a, uh, a little rectangular top and, and a little perforation, uh, drawn completely accurately by, by Rosa Wallis. I should add that an analysis has shown it not to be a bronze as, the, as it looked, as it appeared at the time, but to consist of an extremely debased silver, and it is now to be identified as a Scandinavian import belonging to the so called Vestfold type of stick pin, so the, the man buried it. Uh, at um, uh, Killoran Bay was in possession of a Norwegian type of uh, uh, import of, of dress fastener. Now, the, um, there are 130 uh, extant uh, iron nails and rivets from Killoran Bay, a few of which appear on this uh, photograph that you've seen before, some of which have mineralized wood attached, which John Hatha has identified as oak. 
These have been studied by the Mar Scandinavian maritime archaeologist Jan Bill, who concluded that there was a very likely had, that it was very likely that there had been a complete boat in the grave with a maximum length of 12 metres. This makes it over twice the size of that in the Westness boat grave already mentioned, being more comparable to that in the Baladul burial on the Isle of Man, which was about 11 metres in length. Boat burial was widespread in the Viking world, um, uh, although not common in all areas. It was, it was particularly popular in the west of, uh, west of Norway. But there are only perhaps uh, a dozen known from Scotland, uh, as can be seen from this uh, map uh, published by Colleen Beatty, to which uh, another example found in 2015 at Maybach on Papa Westray in Orkney should now be added. However, the actual number is very uncertain because a handful of rivets from a grave discovered during an antiquarian investigation in the 19th century need not necessarily represent a complete boat, as their finders were all too eager uh, to assume. Uh, bits of boats were used both as uh, to place bodies on and as covers for, 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 for graves, or bits of boats, in the case of cremation, bits of boat might have been used on the funeral pile. So there are, there are a number of reasons why you might find boat rivets in a Viking grave without there having ever been a complete boat uh, in, the, in, 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 in the grave. Jan Biel also concluded that the Caloran Bay was very likely standing on its keel, so not inverted, as, as, as um, Galloway uh, had suggested, though he regarded it, I quote, as not completely clear whether this boat contained the burial as is normal or whether it was placed above it, a subject to which we shall have to return. As Shetlig pointed out, uh, one of the respects in which the Caloran Bay boat burial does differ from a regular Norwegian grave from the Viking Age is that it was provided with this stone enclosure, an enclosure of slabs set edgewise, commenting that such must be regarded as a local fashion confined to the Viking settlements in Scotland. As Beale observed, this enclosure is too large to have been constructed within a boat of the calculated size. And so if the burial were to have been a conventional boat grave, then it must have been wrongly perceived or constructed by Galloway, unless, that is, the boat had formed a covering. Um, as a few of you might be able to see, uh, the plan is captioned, the stones much displaced, undermined by rabbits and probably disturbed by searches for treasure, side stones fallen inwards and outwards, covering stones are also fallen in. Four rabbit holes were sufficiently prominent to be marked as such on this plan, but Galloway must have done some tidying up of the side stones if they had, were indeed fallen inwards and outwards, given that he shows them all in vertical positions. Indeed, Beale, in commenting on what he described as the captivating regularity of the excavation plans, suggested that McNeil had failed to observe correctly or Galloway to record accurately a different form of construction, in which there had been, he suggested, flagstones on the outside of the boat on both sides along its central part in order to keep it upright in its trench in the sand dune, and some more flagstones placed inside the boat to serve as dividers between the grave chamber in which the deceased was placed and the fore and aft the vessel. On this basis, he concluded that the conventional boat grave theory provided a more likely explanation than that of a chamber grave below a boat. However, his theory does not take account of the fact that no in situ rows of rivets were observed, rather the opposite, nor does he explain how the vertical slabs depicted by Galloway would have been supported if serving as internal dividers within a boat. Indeed, Anna Ritchie has written in defense of Galloway that it is unreasonable for Beale to have dismissed him as no more than a second-hand witness, pointing out that his experience as a draftsman ensures that he would have not drawn an inaccurate plan. The east end of the enclosure had evidently collapsed in the interval between McNeil's excavation and Galloway commencing his excavation two years later. Back to Galloway's one. 
because it was on extending the, the excavation immediately to the east of where the line of the enclosure on that side must have been that he encountered one of the cross inside slabs which had not been previously disturbed but lay buried amongst the sand that had to be cleared away in order to uncover the skeleton of the horse. From Galloway's plan, it appears that neither cross slab had formed an integral part of the actual enclosure but rather they had been set up individually at either end. However, as observed by Marilyn Brown, these crosses, I'll show them to you again, these crosses are far from prominent and as a statement of belief or even of the acknowledgement of the power of the Christian religion would have had an extremely muted impact. I think we can agree with her on that. So an alternative but to me, more unlikely, an alternative, but to me, a more unlikely hypothesis is that they are just random stones brought with others for use on the site from the early Christian burial ground in the vicinity of Colonsay House. An important difference between the two plans is that on the second uh, one, uh, on Galloway's second one, there is marked the um, Nothing. Oh, there is marked at that point there, in the middle point at one end, there is marked the location of where the spearhead was found. Uh, although it had been found in 1882, it only appears uh, on this 1884 plan. So, located near the centre of the west end of the enclosure. So its shaft, if intact, would have lain across the enclosure, dividing it longitudinally into two parts, with that on the south side containing the crouched male burial and the principal grave goods. It's more clearly seen on the, on the other one. On the first plan, the main weapons are shown placed immediately behind the body, the sword, shield and axe. In front were placed the scales and weights, and at the, at the feet were the remains of an iron pot, separate from a seemingly larger group of what are also labelled remains of iron pot, adjacent to the spearhead. And indeed we think today that it is most likely that there were indeed two, coon, two iron cooking pots in the grave, one of which had the handle previously mentioned in connection with the original saw drawing. The only artefacts recorded as being found in the northern half of the enclosure are the remains of the bronze belting, etc., placed towards the east end. And we're looking up here, that's where they, they, they were found, so well away from the, the main uh, group of weapons and body, uh, but adjacent to uh, what's marked there as A, a small group of human remains. These have inevitably given rise to speculation that this was a double burial, although there is apparently no evidence among the surviving skeletal material for there having been more than one body in the grave. But remember, the extant remains are in poor condition, being badly broken and rather eroded, with many of the smaller bones uh, having entirely decayed. The second group of apparently human remains has been described and discussed by Marilyn Brown, as I quote, lying in a central position at the east end of the grave with at least three long bones and some smaller bones shown at a distance of some 2.1 meters from the other skeleton and about 0.6 meters from the horse harness. The bones do not resemble those of a dog which would be the most probable animal to be buried in a grave also containing a horse. The information on the plan indicated disturbance of the enclosure by rabbits, but it seems unlikely that a group including large and small human bones would have been removed, would have been removed to such a distance from the original interment. It seems likely that there was a second body in the enclosure, presumably since it was accompanied by no grave goods, it had a lower status than the primary interment. The case for a second body within the enclosure is perhaps strengthened by, by suggestion of a division by the spear, with the explanation for the placement of horse harness so far from the principal grave goods being that it was deposited beside the individual responsible for the animal that had been sacrificed for the occasion. By way of comparison, it is said that there were probably two different corpses in the boat burial at Baladul in the Isle of Man, a male to whom apparently the grave goods belonged, and possibly, in this case, an unaccompanied female. So we have a possible uh, insular parallel. 
Uh, Brown went on to speculate that the cross-incised slabs might relate to the probable second burial in the enclosure with the need to identify and protect a Christian included in an otherwise overtly pagan grave. Alternatively, they might have been placed at either end of the enclosure by Christian relatives or other associates of the main man on conclusion of the main pagan cemetery, the main pagan ceremony with its horse killing uh, and possible uh, human sacrifice. Although there is mention of covering stones fallen in, the enclosure cannot have been systematically covered with slabs, for how then could the boat rivets have ended up everywhere within the enclosed area and at all depths? Indeed, the enclosure would appear to have, be, to have uh, been open when the boat was placed over it, unless it had been first covered with something like the sail or, or something similar like that. For there is an extraordinary difference in preservation between the human and the horse bones. I mean, the, the osteologist at first thought that they couldn't possibly be, 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 be contemporary. And the only explanation must have been a significant difference in their immediate environments. The manner in which the boat was placed over the burial enclosure inevitably remains a matter of debate. On the other hand, we can see how Galloway's suggestion that the ship may have been capsized over it became a pseudo-fact once Anderson had categorically stated that the boat had been overturned so as to form a cover over the grave. Although Shetlig himself was more circumspect, referencing the 9th century, probably royal ship burial at Hedeby in Viking Age Denmark. As you can see, this possibly royal uh, ship burial consisted of a wooden chamber grave over the top of which the boat was placed, resting upright upon the keel and supported by heaps of stones. Uh, you can also see, in fact, uh, on, on the slide that there is a, that there is a there's the, not just the main chamber beneath the boat, which contained the human remains. There is a second uh, burial uh, area there, uh, which contained horses. However, the practice of using a boat as a grave cover is indeed rare. Its normal use being as a ready-made burial chamber, uh, as seen uh, elsewhere uh, in Scotland, Iceland, Norway, everywhere else. Well, I show you the, uh, um, the West Ness uh, boat burial that we've already seen. That's the sort of standard uh, way of using a, a boat, a small boat, uh, as a container. Uh, but also um, the uh, uh, top uh, right uh, is the boat burial at Baladul in the Isle of Man, which I've mentioned uh, as also having a possible human sacrifice. Uh, uh, within it, contained within it, uh, and below you see the 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 the, the example from uh, Scar in Orkney, which contained uh, three uh, individuals. Little, of course, can be inferred about the nature and extent of Galloway's proposed lofty how or mound, although in describing his excavation of the horse skeleton, he noted the existence of I quote a layer of mould which lay amid the sand between the remains and the surface. This suggests perhaps the use of cut turbs in its construction, uh, as was demonstrated at Balotier in the Isle of Man, for example. Finally, this uh, imaginative reconstruction of the Hedeby burial procession serves to remind us of how many aspects of the construction of the grave and the associated funeral inevitably elude us just as Galloway himself appreciated. Um, the, 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 the burial chamber contained the remains of, of one significant individual plus two others, uh, and then the horses were in a separate chamber. So even though the, 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 the size and, and the status of this burial is clearly are, are in a different league, uh, there are some striking uh, similarities between the two. But as, what about the, 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 the dating? The current checklist of coin hoards offers the 840s as an approximate date for the deposition of the Killoran Bay coins. But as we've seen, um, this, uh, this overlooks the fact that they were demonetized by being perforated 
uh, and thus they can only provide a rather distant terminus post quem for the burial. A factor that influenced Michael Dolly's suggested deposition date of circa 870. A uh, recent study uh, of the uh, coins mounted on lead weights, as was presumably the case, I mean, the most obvious reason for perforating the center of, of, of a small coin of this kind uh, is, to, is, to, is, to, is to peg it uh, onto something, and, and most probably a, a, a lead weight, which, as you remember, these were found as surface finds, and the lead could easily have, have differentially uh, uh, decayed. So it's, it's, it's most likely that the, these, 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 these coins were there because they formed part uh, of, of, of weights rather than for any other uh, reason. So they must be studied perhaps uh, as a whole uh, with the, with the uh, fine set uh, of, of decorated uh, weights that are decorated with bits of ornamental uh, metalwork. Uh, but recent study of coins mounted on lead weights, as, as was presumably the case with these perforated stikers, has suggested to Gareth Williams that ornamented weights of the type found at Killoran Bay were only introduced in the 860s and 870s, or maybe the third quarter of the 9th century. Shetterlig identified the Killoran Bay sword uh, as belonging to Peterson's type K, which, is a, which has a distinctive five-lobed pommel, and this has been confirmed by X-ray. Recent research has demonstrated that most datable examples of this Scandinavian sword type were deposited during the second half of the 9th century, a period that readily accommodates the dates proposed by Stephen Harrison for both the Dublin type of spearhead, because what is of interest is that although the sword is a Scandinavian object, both the spearhead that you see here uh, and the conical form of the shield boss that you see here uh, are, are of Dublin or Irish sea types. And so his weaponry was coming from two very different uh, areas of activity. Uh, indeed, none of the artifacts need be dated to the 10th century, by which time the balance would certainly have had an old-fashioned appearance. Uh, a neck bone from the horse was radiocarbon dated in 1997, uh, but this added little to the chronological debate other than to confirm that it was from the Viking Age, as if uh, there was I said, any doubt about that. A human bone has since been dated for Ian Armit and David Reich's uh, Genscott pro project, uh, and this gave a calibrated date range of 695 to 939 at 95.4% probability. The two dates have been combined for us by Rick Schulting, uh, and the resulting date for the burial is Cal AD 771 to 953 at 95.4% probability, a range that can, of course, be considerably reduced at the early end on numismatic grounds, as the burial can't possibly have taken place before uh, 850. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, the, um, the, um, Thing. If, you, if, you take the, if you take the um, the uh, eighty five percent eighty five percent probability, uh, you have a date between seven seven one and nine zero one Cal A D. So, with the numismatic evidence, it would come down to between eight fifty and and nine hundred. So, by way of conclusion, the evidence of the grave goods suggests that the Caloran Bay burial took place during the second half of the 9th century, with Dolly's suggestion for the, that the Stikers were deposited circa 870, providing a most plausible date for our ancient sea king's interment, one fully compatible with the combined radiocarbon date, although this does allow for a later date of burial, even if the artifactual evidence suggests otherwise. This summer, marked the 140th anniversary of McNeil's excavation at Cloran Bay, but the excavation that took place there um, this uh, summer was of a rather different kind. Here, thanks to Kevin Kerr, you see Colin Say's new fibre optic cable coming ashore mid-bay with not a Viking uh, in sight. We were seen that the burial was down one end, and so they didn't uh, fortunately come across any more. Uh, by having concentrated on the discovery and biography of the Caloran Bay boat burial, I have had to admit much of, uh, of uh, potential interest concerning the actual grave goods, 
though I'm happy to try uh, and answer any questions that you may have about them. There is indeed much more that could be said of our ancient sea king as a likely first-generation Viking settler, uh, both warrior and trader, a local magnate whose connections stretch from Norway to Dublin, uh, even if I think it's unlikely that he was a veteran of the so-called Great Army in England, as has recently been suggested. A man who was buried in an overtly pagan manner uh, in a Christian island. Despite uh, all our best efforts, there is much that will never now be known, but the fact that there is so much for us to ponder upon is most certainly a tribute to William Galloway for the care with which he carried out his archaeological endeavours, even if he failed us in his duty of publication. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, for that uh, fascinating talk on this astounding and surprising burial. This is a sort of a landscape question, because on the south end, where you're describing the site, the ground is fairly, is like a raised beach and quite flat. It goes up with the water running below it. At the north end, there's another river coming down, but it's much, much hillier. And I've just been thinking about why would they choose the one rather than the other? And obviously, it led me to speculate, listening to this, whether there was any evidence to suggest any habitation lying behind the site, which would not have been possible at the north end because of the mm. hillier uh, landscape. Um, yes, the question of where the, where the, where the habitation um, uh, is, 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 is one that, that, that comes up all too often in the case of, our, of, of Viking graves. When we have habitations, we don't very often find these associated burials. And when we have the burials, we don't always know where the habitations were. But I wonder, I wonder whether, in, in this case, it, it, it's, one shouldn't be looking at, after all, Colonsay House, uh, has you know has remained uh, or became the 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 estate centre and whether 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 the uh, we should be looking somewhere uh, whatever the ecclesiastical settlement there may have been there uh, beforehand uh, whether they they, they didn't uh, take over just from where the the, the the primary settlement is now would would go back that far. Um, that's all I can all I can suggest because no one's ever ever come up with any uh, any evidence for any um, uh, actual settlement sites in in Colonsay or on so despite the fact that we have this remarkable concentration of graves um, the length of, 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 of both islands. No, no, not that I, not that I, not that I, I, I am aware of, and I think there has been, I think there's been quite a lot of field walking and, and, and possibly some metal detecting, um, but I think that I think I see Caroline putting her hand up immediately behind you. She may have an answer. Um, it's not an answer, but um, there is one of the um, Hiberno Scandinavian strap fittings that was found by a metal detectorist from just inland from the bay, which might suggest some kind of activity, um, possibly settlement, immediately behind the actual bay. Another tantalising fragment. Do you think the juxtaposition of the pagan and the Christian adds anything to the de old debate about Norse invaders, Norse settlers? I, I, I think it's... I think, I think it's um, this, but, uh, the, there's... there's it, the grave is unique in this in this sort of uh, um, uh, complicating factor. So all I can suggest is that it is a contribution to the debate, but whether it actually answers uh, anything, I, 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 I don't know. So we simply have no way of getting into the minds um, of the people uh, who are responsible for this. I mean, I'm, I think I think Marilyn Brown's cautious you know, suggestions. Uh, are, are entirely opposite. Though whether whether I don't necessarily go along with her suggestion that, that, that it identifies the religion of the of the second burial. Thanks for that, James. Uh, you've you've ended here on this uh, image of this lovely and quirky set of weights. Uh, 
if the ones capped with the stikas were also presumably inset weights, uh, then that little castle-shaped one sort of remains an outlier for being a different kind of weight, not inset. Do the set of weights hang together as a set according to the sort of weight units that they uh, seem to fit? And, and does that little castle-shaped piece kind of fit into that? I remember many, many, many years ago hearing the late uh, um, the Norwegian archaeologist uh, Egil Bakker give, give, a, give a paper on the, the weight units represented by the, by the Caloran Bay um, uh, weight set at a time when I had no particular reason to be interested in, in, uh, in it, I have to say. Um, and he never published it, and I, um, he, he, had, he had a way of, of, of by, by making different combinations of the weights making it behave very sensibly. Um, it's very hard to recapture, uh, recapture that. Um, and it is, slightly, but it is slightly confused now by the suggestion that there may have been these extra, these extra weights. But I can think of no other reason why, why, why they should have been included in the, in, in, in the way. They're not there, as, clearly, they're not there for ornamental reasons because they're very scruffy little things. And, and you couldn't suspend them very easily just if you... I mean, the, the nice coins that we know that you know, do come in graves occasionally, the, the silver coins you know, tend to be perforated so they can be suspended as part of some sort of uh, neck, neck, neck ring or whatever. And I, I think that the weight suggestion is the most reasonable one. And I think there's no doubt that they are from, from they formed part of the burial since they were, they, they were very specific as well as being from within the, in, the area of the enclosure. Uh, so they're not they're not random uh, settlement finds or something that might that might have gone with the, with the strap end. I I believe I believe in them even though they were not excavated. Um, but I I think that I think that um, the, the, the question of how the weight set is used is is is, is probably a wide open one that, 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 that everybody will have their own opinion on. Um, thanks very much for your wonderful lecture. It was really fascinating to hear all the story behind the, the finding of the burial. I'm also quite intrigued by the similar piece where it's like a kind of castle shaped one, so the kind of lead weight. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on the kind of similarities between that actual individual piece and the kind of gaming pieces that you find that are Irish sea glass. So like the one found at Dunrobin and Linda's farm recently, mm -hmm. where the blue glass. And also if you look at the kind of investigation that the University of York have been doing with um, Torxy yeah. and the gaming pieces like if you thought that if that wasn't maybe a weight maybe it's actually part of a kind of game like king piece for Nefertafel possibly um, just by looking at how the great army had actually almost some tried to recreate the kind of Irish sea ones Yes, this is, this is it's, 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 it's the similarity between, between some of these uh, very, very crudely made lead gaming pieces, which have been found uh, a, a lot in England, associated with the winter camps of, 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 of the, the Danish Viking, uh, so-called Great Ar Ar Army. This has led to the suggestion that this, this man may have had something to do, had some connection with the with the, the Great Army. Um, the, 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 the gaming pieces, the gaming pieces uh, are, are very crudely made and usually hollow, compared with this, which is a which is a which is a solid, complete uh, casting with these projections. It has some slight uh, similarities to the to the terminals of of, of, of some brooches, that, uh, Viking Age brooches that are found in in uh, in, uh, in Scandinavia, particularly in Sweden. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's actually not quite the same as as, as, as either. It was something that might well have served as an inspiration for the for the gaming pieces, <laughs> uh, um, um, but but it is an oddity and it sticks out, um, and so. I'm not sure that we've got the answers to that yet uh, either. I would tend to suggest, think that it was the, game, the influence was going the other way. There's, there's no evidence for a, a set of gaming pieces or, 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 or gaming board in, in, in the burial itself. If, the, if there was, it would have been completely organic. It would have been completely bone or something like that. I can't, we can't rule that out completely. After we got you know, from the West Ness graves, again, there's a very nice set of gaming pieces um, that's on display in the, in, in, in the National Museum. So it is theoretically possible that there was a that there was a, a, a gaming set within the burial, but no ev no actual surviving evidence. First question: Are there any plans to do further testing on the skeletal material, such as DNA testing and the like? 
we had we had uh, great excitement about about the possibility that we were going to be able to re reconstruct the genome of the horse, um, but unfortunately the, the, the sample has, has has turned out I mean it, not to uh, not to have have, have worked. It just came back to say, well, it's a male horse. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. We, we we could have guessed that all horses are male horses um, from the burials. Um, um, uh, and uh, I, th th there isn't enough. The, 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 the preservation of, 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 the, of the human remains is not, is not, I'm afraid, sufficient to, to enable us to, to, to apply the technique successfully. Interesting, you should see that, because one of the other questions is uh, the human remains are in such poor condition, can you be sure it's a man that is buried? Well, the, the osteologist um, uh, was. was, uh, was she was satisfied that the, 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 I think basically the robust nature of the bones was, was, was more likely to be male uh, than, 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 than not. Uh, I haven't got the full report uh, with me, I'm afraid. On a slightly different tack then, um, one from Jan Binney. Um, what is likely to have happened to Galloway's lantern slides left to the society by his sister after his death? Um, there's no evidence that Galloway had lantern Slides, and I think the reason why the Reza Wallace, um, uh, why, why the, the, his drawings were, were, were made, was so that, they, that the talk could be illustrated uh, with the with the uh, watercolor illustration. So there's, there's no, we have no photographs of any of the finds surviving before the um, what the one published by Brigger in 1930. Alas, uh, it would have been very nice if that had been the case. Okay, um, I've got another one. Would there have been any kind of marker at the grave site to identify the deceased in the years after his death? I'm assuming from the image you showed that there was a mass sticking out. I'm, of the, ass I'm assuming that there would have been, I, I think I, I go along with, with, with Galloway's suggestion that, 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 that it would have been marked by a substantial mound. Uh, and indeed, there's always the possibility that if the mast was, well, no, this wouldn't have had a, no, this wouldn't have had a mast because this is a, a rowing boat, not a sailing boat. Um, uh, the head of is a rail ship burial, and the apple was a sailing vessel. Uh, so there wouldn't have been a mast, but if there was a, a post set up, then of course that would have been organic and that would have gone together with the mound. Um, an iron buckle is listed among the finds. Has it ever been established if it was associated with the horse harness or the deceased? The, uh, arm, the arm buckle uh, was found um, in association with the actual horse skeleton. Though it's not well, it's not, it's not it's that large, so it's a slight, it is slightly, slightly enigmatic, but it, that was not found in the main enclosure. The arm buckle was found associated with the horse by, by Galloway in his uh, campaign. Thank you for answering all these questions, James. May I call on Dr. Anna Ritchie, please, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. What a treat we've had tonight, from snowy Edinburgh to ever sunlit Colonsay, which I'm sure many of you remember. Thank you, James, for a really most illuminating lecture. And the results of your meticulous research and that of your colleagues has um, mitigated many of the misconceptions that we've been suffering uh, under as regards this very important burial. Um, I think if William Galloway had been here tonight, he would have been really pleased at the way that you've um, taken away some of the uncertainties. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, brings our proceedings for today to a conclusion. May I just remind you that our January lecture, which will be here, will be by Professor Margaret Connolly of the University of St Andrews. And her topic is Cut Out and Stuck In, Fragments of Medieval Manuscripts in 19th Century Albums. So that's uh, the third uh, Thursday in January. And to wish everybody both in the room and listening over Zoom uh, a very happy Christmas and a good new year when it comes. And we we'll look forward to seeing you in January. Thank you.